Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Alexis, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lung, uh, for your excellent overview of health effects. And uh, Xi Bing Wan, you did an outstanding job summarizing a very busy three-day meeting. Uh, quite impressive. You're able to do that so quickly. Um, so, uh, yeah, my talk's going to be a little different than the first three in that I'm not going to go into as much of, of details of studies, but really more a methodological approach for how we look at health effects and exposures. Um, so the overview of what I'm going to talk about is how we use um, scientific evidence to assess hazards to health from air pollution. And then, as Alexis pointed out, people spend time in specific locations where they interact with, with relatively high concentrations of air pollution. And in addition to the street canyon effect, um, we also spend a lot of time indoors. And it may not be so obvious that even though we're in this room right now, we are still exposed to air pollution from outside. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the implication of that is that uh, your personal breathing of air pollution is something that could be targeted with personal policies or voluntary policies as well as governmental regulations like we've heard in terms of how do we control outdoor air pollution. So the bottom line is there's more ways to manage uh, your personal interaction with air pollution than just simply managing outdoor air pollution. Um, so. I should say just uh, briefly, uh, some of my background is I have um, chaired a scientific committee in the US that reviews the science for setting uh, national ambient air quality standards. And so some of my comments are really based on that experience. Um, I'm an engineer, so I'm not a medical doctor, but I work a lot with um, medical doctors, epidemiologists, toxicologists, and others to look at how do we assess the, the health impact of um, air pollution. And um, uh, Dr. Leung's presentation emphasized that there are many different kinds of evidence. Some of it are controlled experiments with human subjects, and this is how we measure things like lung function decrement. Um, there are epidemiologic studies that are based on statistical analysis of large populations. Um, there are also toxicological studies, some involving animals, some involving human tissue studies, and so on. And these provide different kinds of evidence. Um, a controlled experiment is, is a good way to prove that inhaling air pollution causes an adverse effect. Um, epidemiologic studies are much more flexible in looking at a broader range of effects, um, but there's the question of do we know that there's a causal relationship. And so often we'd like to look at epidemiology and controlled experiments together to determine, first of all, that there's an association of an adverse effect with air pollution and that the air pollutant is actually causing that adverse effect. Um, and toxicological studies are also helpful for looking at causality, um, but not necessarily human health endpoints. So all of these things together give us uh, evidence to say air pollution is, in fact, causing adverse effects. Um, I won't go into details, but for example, an example of a controlled human experiment is spirometry, which involves measuring lung function. Um, there are also uh, bronchioscopes that can measure airway inflammation. And this is an example on the, on the left, you have the bronchioles of a healthy subject, and on the right, you have an inflamed airway, which is restricting airflow. And this could be a response you get from exposure to a pollutant such as ozone, for example, or nitrogen dioxide. And so that compromises the health status of that individual. So this is how air pollution is actually interacting with the body. Um, this is an example from an epidemiologic study of what we call a dose-response relationship, showing uh, on the vertical axis the relative hazard from um, exposure, and on the horizontal axis the ambient concentration of fine particles. And you know, with the statistical models from epidemiologic studies, we see a trend line, but we also see an uncertainty range. And one of the things we have to assess is, do we know that this relationship is statistically significant, um, but do we also know that it's causal, that there's actually a real cause and effect relationship? Uh, so the ways to determine that air pollution causes adverse effects is to rule out in an epidemiologic study, for example, the possibility that we just have a random chance finding. 
and to recognize, as, as Dr. Young put it, pointed out, that there are other things that could cause adverse effects besides ambient air pollution, like cigarette smoking. So can we control for that? And are there other biases? And some, and some I won't go into details, but there are different study designs uh, for epidemiologic studies, and some of them introduce biases. Um, another way we look at causality is if we have multiple studies, do they consistently show the same kind of association? Uh, and that gives us more confidence. But even better is if we have what we call coherence. If we have epidemiology and toxicology and controlled experiments with humans, do they give similar findings even though they're very different methods? Um, and then also, um, if we're looking at epidemiologic findings, which give us a statistical association, do we have a biological model for why there would be an adverse effect that, that helps us interpret the epidemiologic association? And so these are, these are some of, this is not all the factors in causality, but these are many of the important ones. And the reason I emphasize this is um, there's actually a debate emerging in some parts of the U.S. denying that there's a causal relationship between air pollution and health effects. And I, I think it's very important from a scientific basis to say, yes, we have a lot of confidence that there really is an adverse effect uh, from exposure to air pollution. Um, over the years, um, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency staff and external scientific advisors uh, who I've worked with as, as uh, uh, the part of the committee I mentioned earlier, have reviewed um, science assessments for different air pollutants, um, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, fine particles, carbon monoxide, and ozone among those, and looked at different outcome categories, uh, cardiovascular um, illness or respiratory illness or premature death, um, and assessed for which of those do we have strong evidence that there is a causal relationship or very likely to be a causal relationship? And fine particulate matter is um, probably the most strong, strongly related to adverse effects, that there's very strong evidence that it causes cardiovascular illness, it causes premature mortality uh, from short-term exposures and from long-term exposures. And I, I won't go through all of the, the, the cells in the table, but you know there are some endpoints where there's just not much evidence yet. That doesn't mean there wouldn't be in the future. Um, like for example, with ozone, um, we, we know with certainty that it causes respiratory illness. Um, we're pretty sure it causes cardiovascular illness. Uh, the weight of evidence is a little weaker for that. But with more data in the future, that may, that may change that determination. Okay, so um, from a policy perspective, uh, in the U.S., we develop air quality standards that uh, under the Clean Air Act must be, quote, requisite to protect public health with, uh, quote, an adequate margin of safety. And this means, uh, and when I say this means, it's been interpreted uh, not just by scientists, but by the federal courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court, to mean that uh, it is allowable to address uncertainty. So even if we're not exactly sure of an adverse effect, we could still develop a standard to protect the public against a, a, a anticipated threat to health. Um, we should provide a reasonable degree of protection, um, and we should protect not only the general public, but sensitive or highly exposed members of the general public, including uh, children, and, and we heard an excellent explanation of why children are particularly uh, susceptible. For example, their lung development um, is very susceptible to exposure to air pollution. Um, outdoor workers who are highly exposed or elderly uh, who may have frail health and other, other subgroups. Um, in the U.S., we interpret this does not mean zero risk for every person, uh, but it does mean protecting the vast majority of people in each of these groups. Um, now, I will say the air quality standard is really focused on air quality, not your personal interaction with air pollution. And that's where we transition into maybe a new way of looking at air pollution. It's not just what do we measure at the ambient air monitor, but what do we measure in this room or on the MTR or the bus or the taxi or your home or the shopping center. Um, and we refer to e each of these locations as a microenvironment. So a microenvironment is a place where we can characterize 
um, the concentration. And um, Gail Hagler will talk a little bit more about some of the instruments that can be used uh, to do those types of measurements. Um, but for example, in Hong Kong, Hong Kong has a very excellent um, ambient air quality monitoring network, very high quality. Uh, Dr. Peter Louie and others have done a tremendous amount of work over the decades to create this, this uh, very important um, regulatory and scientific tool of air quality monitoring. Um, but for example, the, the fixed site monitor uh, in Yen Long is on top of a building. Now, how many of you live on top of that building? Right. Nobody, right? So that doesn't represent your personal exposure. Um, now, there are roadside monitors, and some of us may walk by these from time to time. And so at that moment, uh, the Causeway Bay monitor, which is not very high above street level, actually is a very good indicator of exposure concentration when you're standing next to it. But if you're, you know, 100 meters away from it, is it really going to represent your personal interaction with air pollution? Uh, and maybe not, um, but it's an excellent tool and it's an important source of data uh, for trends analysis and regulatory compliance. So here we are in, in the Hong Kong Club building um, on a slightly clearer day than today, apparently. Um, but even though we're in this nice room and we have sealed windows, we still are exposed to some ambient air pollution that infiltrates through cracks in the building envelope or comes in through the heating and ventilating and air conditioning system now, we're not exposed to as high of a concentration as we are outdoors, but we are still exposed uh, to some amount of pollution here. Now, this is a, a kind of old diagram, um, and it's not a very pretty looking diagram, but it's an important one uh, in that it's one of the first uh, published um, illustrations of time activity patterns that, that demonstrates, despite people's perception, even people who think they're spending a lot of time outdoors really are not spending a lot of time outdoors <clears throat> if you look at um, the time spent uh, indoors at your residence, well, at nighttime, if you're sleeping at home, it's tremendous, right? Um, you spend time at school or at work or inside a vehicle or in the mall. Um, very little time is spent outdoors. Uh, and so most of your interaction with air pollution is indoors. Uh, so that, you know, raises the question of how, how much pollution gets into the indoors, and I, I've described a little bit of that. Uh, pollutants enter the building envelope in different ways. Um, open doors, cracks in the envelope, the heating and ventilating system, and so on. Uh, there can also be indoor sources, and I will say in our work with the, the Praise Project that Alexis talked to, uh, we're focusing really on ambient pollution that gets indoors. I think indoor pollution is, is another topic altogether and is also very important, um, but maybe that's for another day. Um, but just conceptually, if we look at, say, indoor fine particles, we have an ambient contribution that depends on things like air exchange rate of the air in this room with the outside, uh, the, the volume of the room, the penetration of particles into the room, and deposition of particles onto surfaces of the room that remove particles from the air. And roughly speaking, on average for fine particles, about the concentration in a room like this might be something like 60% of the outdoor concentration. Now, if we have a filtration system in the building, that could go down to maybe 10%. Uh, so there is some protection from being indoors, but you're not completely avoiding the particles by being in this room. Uh, we can uh, develop mass balance models of varying levels of sophistication. I won't go into detail, but this is a model we published in a paper on, on cabin air uh, exposures in vehicles and taking into account that we could recirculate cabin air, or we could bring in fresh air, and we may or may not have a cabin air filter in the, in the vehicle. Um, this is an experiment we did on the road, and I'll just focus on, on this value. This is the indoor-outdoor ratio in a uh, car, so uh, this is a passenger car. And if you have the windows open, then the indoor cabin air in your car is basically the same as the ambient air. If you have your windows closed with the air conditioning running and you're recirculating air, in the vehicle maybe you're exposed to about 30% of the concentration that's outdoors. So this is an illustration that depending on your own personal choices for comfort in the vehicle, you can significantly affect your own exposure to fine particles. And this is an example of what we mean by a personalized approach to managing air quality. 
Um, this is a study that um, we did at UST uh, a few years ago um, to, to measure uh, different uh, transport microenvironments and just compare them on a uh, relative basis. Uh, and so, for example, uh, if you're standing at um, outside on a road, we sort of normalize to a roadside monitor like Causeway Bay. Um, if you're at UST, which is a beautiful campus, and you're indoors, you know, you have very low exposure. Um, if you're on a single-decker or double-decker bus, which is very well sealed um, and has a cabin air filter, um, actually you're fairly well protected against fine particles. Uh, if you're on a minibus, which is, you know, probably the windows are not quite as well sealed, you have slightly higher exposure. Um, and, you know, some of the indoor shopping malls may be a little higher than on, on the MT, on, sorry, on the double-decker bus. Um, so this is another example of how, you know, your own route choice, like should I take a bus, should I take the MTR, should I take a taxi, you could make decisions if you knew what these exposures were and if you were concerned about the exposures. Um, so that leads us to exposure, and I know uh, it's the English word exposure doesn't translate well into Chinese. Um, so uh, you can think of it as a personal health index. Um, in Chinese. Uh, but the basic idea is exposure is contact of chemicals with the outer boundary of the body, and we're focusing on inhalation. Uh, what happens, though, if we, if we imagine this is the outer boundary of the body, so like, say your nose, so a chemical contacts your nose, but you're breathing that into your body, so it crosses a, a boundary of your nose into your lungs. And there it may cross an absorption barrier, such as the alveoli, where it crosses into the bloodstream. Uh, and you might have fine particles then reach a target organ. So exposure is uh, assumed to be proportional to the internal delivered dose. And therefore, it's, a, it's a relatively easier to measure metric of dose than trying to measure what actually reaches your internal organs. Um, exposure is also uh, a key link uh, between environmental release, say emissions from a power plant or a vehicle, and then the air quality concentration, the exposure. The exposure then leads to a target organ dose, early biological effects, and finally an adverse outcome like respiratory illness or premature death. So exposure is part of that linkage, and that's why it's important. Um, in the standard review process, I, I will not go through this in detail, I just want to emphasize that exposure assessment uh, in, in reviewing the air quality standard in the US is a big part of that review. It's something we, we pay a lot of attention to. It's a, it's a critical link between air quality and health effects. Um, so uh, in terms of what kinds of questions could we answer with an exposure-based method to looking at air quality, um, well, exposure depends on your activity. The, the person sitting next to you and you will have different exposures today because you will go to different places at different times. Um, so we want to know the activity patterns for people to understand these exposures. We also want to know the, the, the pollution concentrations in different microenvironments and how those relate to the ambient concentrations that we already can measure or model very well. And then we'd like to know how sensitive are the exposures to these time activity patterns and to the microenvironmental concentrations and then which activities and microenvironments contribute the most to your exposure and then what could we do to control that? How could we effectively manage your exposure? Or how could you make an informed choice to manage your own personal exposure? And in order to make that choice, you need information first. And so that's part of what praise is about, is providing you that information. Um, in terms of how we do exposure modeling, uh, there are uh, models that are based on um, diary databases where we have uh, for every minute of every day, we record where a person spends their time and create a database of that. Um, we measure microenvironments, so we know what the concentrations are typically in different microenvironments. And then we have a model that simulates a random person. It assigns them a diary. It takes them through different microenvironments, and we predict their um, concentrations. And then we come up with, a, say, a daily average uh, exposure concentration. And so these models need air quality data, they need diary data, they need demographic data, and they need um, microenvironmental concentration data. 
Um, there are a number of models used, for example, in the air quality standard setting process in the U.S. that have been applied to a wide variety of pollutants. Um, and most notably, we've recently completed reviews on ozone, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. And this kind of exposure modeling was used in all of those recent reviews. This helps us understand you know, who is highly exposed and who is um, going to be facing the highest concentrations that we want to be careful to protect in setting a standard. Uh, this is what the model looks like, where we have the input databases I talked about. And then we sample from these databases using statistical methods to generate basically synthetic people. But they are people who have characteristics of real people. And then we can predict for each of those people what their exposures are over time, and also how their exposures compare across different individuals. Um, I won't go into detail on this. I'm going to skip a few slides. Um, one thing I will mention, here's an example uh, of what we predict is the ratio of ambient exposure to ambient concentration using this kind of modeling tool. And so, for, for example, when I said, you know, on average, your exposure to fine particles indoors is about 60% of outdoors, that's roughly the average of this distribution of the ratio of indoor to outdoor concentration. But it's highly variable depending on a lot of factors, some of which you could control like the heating and ventilating system design or operation of a building. And so this is something property managers might want to be aware of to improve uh, the health of their occupants, for example. Um, so the exposure assessment vision is to develop an integrated systems approach to better address not just scientific regulatory challenges, but also personal information and, and helping people make their own decisions. Um, I'm going to, I think I'll skip this slide because I'm out of time. So um, I, I think the bottom line is uh, exposure science itself is, is a developing field. And this is what we're talking about here is really at the leading edge of the application of exposure science to personalize information to put it in the hands of the public. Um, it's become accepted as an integral re part of science review. Um, but there's an opportunity to shift from just managing air quality at, at central monitoring sites to managing air quality at the most important monitoring site, which is you, your own nose. And there are emerging technologies and techniques that are making this possible. Uh, some is the modeling I've talked about. Some is what Gail's going to talk about next on um, uh, monitoring. So thank you very much.